I have with me today Ambassador Talmiz Ahmed. He was India's ambassador to Saudi Arabia twice and also to UAE and Oman. He's with us with the print talking about his new book West Asia at War. Welcome to the print and thank, thank you, you for talking much. to us. Thank um, you. So to quickly start off uh, this book has come at the best of times i would say this is a time where a lot of uh, discourse is being talked about what is happening at west asia in the backdrop we also have a russia ukraine war raging on uh, do you think um, this war would have an impact on so also on west asia and then we'll come to west asia of course whatever is happening there the events in ukraine the conflict as it has been organized particularly by the west is seen as a singular confrontation which has global implications it is to ensure that the present us led hegemony is remains intact and that the united states remains the leader of the western world and the western alliance so that europe if it had any aspirations to becoming an independent role player Mm -hmm. is not allowed that opportunity the united states is also very anxious to mobilize global support for this enterprise but it is extraordinary that there have been so many remarkable changes taking place in west asia that other than kuwait not a single west asian country has supported the united states yes that's and true and this is a remarkable thing because many of these countries mm -hmm. have been allies of the united states for the last term um, 70 years the mm -hmm. saudis from from 1945 mm -hmm. israel from 1967 mm -hmm. and indeed very very strong alignment between these countries and the united states so something has seriously changed in the region mm -hmm. and possibly in world order mm -hmm. so um you 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 actually said the right thing in the sense we've seen how india has sort of come under attack from the west for not taking a side and not basically calling out russia we've seen uh, india along with uae abstaining in the un votes uh, what do you have to say to that uh, because what people say that well for india they had they should have done this because it's a like minded democracy uh, for uae it also came as a surprise to the us we read certain articles uh, op-eds that you know ua being an ally of the us it was unexpected what do you have to say to that one should never accuse the americans of a long term strategic vision they are the most completely self absorbed and self centered nation living entirely for their own interest mm -hmm. The United States does not believe in having partnerships. It doesn't have partners. They have this fundamental motto: "You are either with us or you are against us." Mm -hmm. And if you are with us, you are there to subserve American interests. That's it. There is never any exhibition of sensitivity to the concerns and and interests of the other side, which is why today you find. all of west asia turning its back on the americans large parts of other parts of asia are also doing the same mm -hmm. and they have shown a remarkable absence of understanding with regard to india india has had a certain role in world affairs that goes back to our independence we've had certain positions we have adopted independent positions earlier it used to be called non alignment and now it's strategic autonomy we are a very large and very substantial country right. and a major role player in world affairs and suddenly you find the americans putting pressure so publicly upon india a near total absence of any understanding of where we are coming from and what our interests are so i think that and you know one of the things that happened which was extremely disappointing is that we had this very junior official of indian origin being dispatched to delhi and he has the temerity to say publicly that if you don't back the americans or if you continue the kind of relationship you have with the russian there will be consequences you're talking about us deputy nsa uh, the deputy, deputy nsa won the leap sing mm -hmm. but this is what is this is what is happening if this is diplomacy then god help us and god help the america but the 
the international community's position is very categorical and very clear. They have understood the American game plan and they don't want to be part of it. Mm -hmm. Um, so now coming to your book, as I said, it's a very timely book uh, by HarperCollins. Uh, it's a publication. Now you've talked extensively about um, Arab uh, nationalism, something that, you know, is really talked about in India. Uh, I mean, the present day discourse uh, sort of starts from Arab Springs. Nobody talks about the Arab nationalism uh, and everything it it seems as if it starts from the Arab Springs and as if the world changed only after that. Uh, your thoughts on that, sir, and if you can share a few details on that. See, this book is the product of a very long engagement with West Asia and North Africa from my side professionally. I have lived in many of the countries that are discussed here for long periods. Kuwait, Baghdad, Sanaa, Jeddah, yeah. Riyadh, all of them, I've lived there. I have traveled to almost every other country mentioned in the book. I And I have read very extensively. And I have been there from 1976. My first posting was in Kuwait in 76. Therefore, I have, I am quite familiar with the region. The second point I want to make is that I took the rare decision in my service of specializing. And this happened as a result of the events of 9-11. I was sitting in Dhamam on that fateful day and watched these towers coming down in real time. And I took the personal decision not to leave the region because I knew that whatever is happening today is going to resonate for the rest of the century. And that is why I thought that I, who have a certain degree of knowledge and expertise with regard to the region, I should not abandon it. I should be there in order to ensure that I can interpret what is happening and then safeguard our national interest, which is very deep. Energy, economic, community, logistic, mm. all are these. So this is the background. Now, this book is aimed at the average Indian reader. The one who is very curious about what is happening in West Asia, bewildered by the stories of competitions and conflicts, uh, about jihad from time to time, petroleum, religion, finance, Absolutely. and migration. Eight and a half million people living there, but doesn't have the connection, mm. doesn't, is not able to connect these various things. This is an effort to make up for this lacuna. Now, at the same time, a useful book, which is scholarly in terms of research, but it presents the, the various developments in a reader-friendly manner is not readily available anyway. Mm -hmm. The other point is that the discourse relating to West Asia is very solidly dominated by Western writers. And therefore, it is from to them that we turn. Go to any scholar in our university writing a PhD thesis. He's only reading British and American material. There is no alternative perspective. So what I have done is go back a bit and weave a coherent narrative of the region. I have started with the arrival of Napoleon. I've, I've titled the first chapter, West Asia, you know, West Asia enters the modern world. Mm -hmm. So I've started with and Napoleon. The Western intervention. Yeah, but I'm not so much interested in Napoleon. I'm interested in how the region reacted to Napoleon right. and, uh, and how they had confusions, they had bewilderment, they have, uh, they had a sense of loss in terms of their earlier heritage and how they then attempted to respond to this challenge. Very similar to the, to the debates and discussions we had in our own country through the 19th century. Right. But we know so much about Raja Ram Mohan Rai and Keshav Chandar Sen and Swami Dayana. We know almost no name from West Asia. So I have attempted to do that and then rapidly move into the 20th century and to and to set out all the confusions, the conflicts, the competitions, mm -hmm. the confrontation, the war mm -hmm. that have happened and that have defined the region that we have today. The Arab Spring is only the latest event, as you would have seen. The subtitle of my book is very telling. 
mm-hmm. it's uh, it refers to war mm-hmm. in the main title with repression resistance and great power game so these are right. three forces in play mm-hmm. simultaneously in the region defining everything that is happening mm-hmm. so also you spoke a lot in your book on the us interventions in the region from the iraq war uh, to the palestinian intifada now yes. uh, that also something we read a uh, very limited amount of books we have and also from a western perspective uh, how do you think us intervention there uh, led to the maybe the progress or whatever happened in that uh, in that region and also uh, parallel to that so west asia north africa uh, which in in indian foreign policy terms is known as wana region do you think uh, that the priority towards that from india's foreign policy perspective is sort of fading away now and we need to focus more uh, two points two separate points number 1 the us role the us role is a continuum as you will recall the 19th century defined the in the 19th century the british and the french were the crucial role players in defining the politics of the region yeah. they in fact literally defined the cartography the maps and gave their names and uh, provided the rulers the americans picked up from this i have set out that the americans were very reluctant entrants into the region and other than saudi arabia they actually knew no part of the region at all and even saudi arabia only from the perspective of oil but the americans were pushed forward in expanding their presence in the region by the dynamics of the cold war they were terrified that this region should not fall under the soviet influence mm-hmm. this is oil rich so the central importance of the region was the petroleum factor petroleum was an economic was a very important economic asset but crucially it was a strategic asset mm-hmm. its its importance had already been shown in the first world war and the second world war and indeed the absence of access to oil was part of the defeat of the germans both in the first and the second world war and the availability of this huge quantity of reserves all across west asia was of crucial importance as far as the west there was concerned that is what brought the american in but at no stage over the last uh, 40 years have the americans developed the kind of expertise understanding sensitivity in terms of the background of this region and its dynamics that should have been absolutely essential mm-hmm. if a big power is supposed to be a role player in this vast region they remained aliens in the region constantly angry bitter afraid and resorting to violence whenever their own wishes were thwarted and you know for example the global jihad they used to think oh islam is a natural ally of the west because they are against godless communism and they went along with saudi arabia and pakistan to make the anti soviet struggle in afghanistan into a jihad very few americans know this today mm-hmm. and they were shocked that if you were to tell any american today that 911 happened because of what you did in afghanistan all those years ago you created the jihad you created al qaeda you you had been patrons of al of osama bin laden they don't know any of that that's being airbrushed similar pattern of interventions across the region were due to domestic politics the israelis had inveigled themselves very deeply into american affairs were part of the domestic political establishment and they were they had a lobby that was extremely influential they ran us policy in west asia and if you did not support israel you were anti semitic and that was it therefore this was another factor that influenced them so ignorance prejudice domestic lobbies subservience to the israeli interest all these were facts look at their role why has it been such a disaster zone for the americans is because they got into major conflicts 
with no long term strategic planning no no deployment of resources that were required no understanding of what we want to achieve and no time frame and therefore you have the absolute disasters of afghanistan iraq and libya these are disasters for the people concerned let us be very clear the american heart bleeds for the ukrainians in in one day the americans killed more afghans and more iraqis on the first day of carpet bombing then the there will be killed in the entire ukraine war mm -hmm. and this is a, one of the most bewildering aspect with regard to indian approach india has it in, in india has always attached considerable importance to the region and that remains so and uh, you would also have seen that prime minister modi surprised many of us when he uh, uh, went to the region so many times uh, from 2015 to 2019 onwards what i have been disappointed about and that was brought out in the book is that our approach has not evolved that as the world has changed and indeed the region has changed and new challenges have emerged there should there was no commensurate change in our understanding and approach mm -hmm. i have pointed out that the approach we had through the cold war and even after the 30 years after the cold war was transactional and bilateral mm -hmm. and therefore we were able to maintain relations with iran and with israel and with saudi arabia and uae but today the scenario particularly after the arab spring the whole region has become so confrontational and contentious and so frequently has been at the edge of war we should have been role players there True. we had the gravitas mm -hmm. we had the standing we had a very high degree of uh, cultural comfort we were respected in the region and prime minister himself prime minister modi had created the foundation for this kind of new approach look at every every joint statement it speaks of strategic partnership even when we had sheikh mohammed bin zaid visit to india the joint article speaks of regional peace and security mm -hmm. and prime minister has given him it was never translated into policy okay i'll, I'll come to that sir but before that let me just uh, ask you a few things on the uh, arab springs in terms of uh, is was that the cause for which we saw the effect as abraham accords one and also from the abraham accords we saw a quad two sort of developing now you've spoken about quad two as bullet points um if you would like to share some more aspect on that uh, how important that is well the the pattern that we see in regard to west asian developments indicates the persistence of repression on the one hand mm -hmm. and resistance on the other and this constitutes the framework of my presentation as well repression initially was colonial and later it became authoritarian and again in terms of uh, external presence in the region quasi colonial or neo imperialist mm -hmm. once again and constantly the people of the region have resisted the pattern of resistance therefore i have placed the arab spring as the latest expression of resistance to authoritarianism mm -hmm. authoritarianism is not just that you have a tyrant on the throne or in the republican palace mm -hmm. you have a tyrant who's sustained by western uh, western power so that his first loyalty is to the west rather than to the welfare of his own people this is resistance therefore this duality of resisting the west western intervention and domestic tyranny are two sides of the same coin the arab spring was a shock for the local potentates four of them fell but then the forces of counter revolution as set out in the book used very robust violence to ensure that the various agitations were stilled but they came back 
in 2018, 2020, they were again there and new countries were engulfed in that. They were stopped for a while uh, by the pandemic, but they are again, they have not gone away. They have not gone away. The what uh, I am a severe critic of the term Abraham Accord. And I ask constantly my interlocutor, what does the prophet of the Old Testament have to do with this absolutely opportunistic and short term uh, uh, agreement? Nothing. I told an Israeli interlocutor recently that you deal with the Palestinians and I will use the word Abraham Accord. But till you do that, I'm not going to label your opportunism. What the Israelis want is to have an engagement with various Arab states without conceding anything to the Palestinians. I asked my Israeli interlocutor that your delegations go to Rabat and Casablanca. They go to Abu Dhabi and Dubai. They go to Cairo. But they will not go five kilometers to the West Bank and talk to the Palestinians right in front of you. What you want to do is to engage with the Arabs without doing anything for the Palestinians and it's not working. And it will not work. It has not worked for the last so many years. The Palestinian struggle is still going on. With every setback, every defeat, every mass murder, every assassination, they still are there. And when they have no weaponry, they use stones. And how much privation they have suffered. More than half the population has experienced prison. How many beatings they have taken on their backs. They have, Israel has had policies of breaking bones as state policy. Now, this has not gone away. So this has nothing to do with that. What happened is UAE reached out to Israel and the United States in an electoral context to curry favor with the incumbents, Donald Trump and Netanyahu, and to gain some plus points. They also had possibly that even if Netanyahu is defeated or Trump is defeated, the Israel lobby will be so pleased with us that we will be able to gain some plus points. But none of that has any strategic value. Both of them have gone into the dustbin of history and hopefully will remain there for some time or for a very long time. But what has it changed? It has gained nothing. There was a hope in Tel Aviv and in Washington of Donald Trump. There would be a surge of Arab countries coming up and they didn't. What did you get? You have the UAE where the Emirati population is 12% of the entire country and therefore they don't have to worry about public opinion. Bahrain, you can barely see on the map and doesn't count at all. And then Morocco and Sudan. Morocco, you had to bribe by saying, I recognize your occupation of Western Sahara. It is not yours to recognize. And no one else has followed, neither the United Nations nor the European Union nor anyone else in the world. Sudan, because of you had to remove them from the list of countries that sponsor terrorism. It just shows how bogus that list is. That as an opportunistic collision removed them, also gave them development assistance of a billion dollars. None of that matters because now they have a military coup. No other country came forward. So, but then how do you think the Biden administration will uh, sort of promote and go ahead with the Abraham Accords? They are not going ahead at all. Biden has given us the most confusing signals that a U.S. president can give. He has picked up where Trump left off. The chaos of Trump is followed by the bewilderment of Biden. He has no clue of what's happening. He, for a, he indicated early in his tenure that he is going to be disengaged from the region. He is not disengaged just from the region. He is disengaged. <laughs> Period. And that is the presidency. But what we have to accept is that the U.S. has lost a lot of credibility in West Asia over a long period. So four years of Donald Trump and one year of Biden have ensured that no, other than Kuwait, which was occupied once by itself and therefore has a certain unique position, 
other than COVID, not a single country of West Asia and North Africa has supported the American enterprise in Ukraine. So what is what is left of? So there is not just this engagement. There is a near total loss of American credibility as security providers and role players in the region. The region has moved on from the Americans. There is a fatigue with regard to subservience to the Americans and they moved on. They have other engagements. They value their ties with Russia and China. And that's why they, have, they don't want to be involved uh, with the backing the Americans in this effort. Mm -hmm. That is so, the background. So, but oil will continue to play a major role in Absolutely. geopolitics. Even yes. in Russia-Ukraine war, we can see the entire discourse is now who's Absolutely. buying oil and why should one buy? Absolutely correct. And this is again, a, I would say, a source of criticism for the American policy. Because as I had said, there is no strategic vision. Spontaneously, on 8 March, the Americans announced that there would be sanctions on energy exports of Russia. No consultations either with the Europeans who are the consumers and no consultations with the Gulf producers, taking them on board. So it came as a shock to the global energy market. And you saw what happened. Prices went from 100 to 140 and then came back and have stabilized at 125. And of course, due to various geopolitical things, they swing. But there is a great uncertainty and turmoil in the region today. And the world is adjusting to it. The Europeans are in a state of shock. Because they are all facing elections, some of them. They, the Americans have once again done what they do best. Mistreat their partners. Mm -hmm. Never consult with them. Never take them on board. I would say to you that I wouldn't be surprised if after some months, the Europeans start looking at their own interests, which is already happening in certain countries, muted at this stage, very muted at this stage. But it is going to happen because this is not the way you treat partners. I had felt the same when the Americans had withdrawn from the JCPOA and uh, impose sanctions on Iranian oil. Right. And I had felt at that time that India should have resisted, should have made it clear to Donald Trump that you have interests, we also have interests. But we had, in, a, in, an, in an environment of total subservience, accepted the American diktat. Not doing that anymore. Because this is a pattern which hurts you. Look at the state of economies of Europe today. They get, Germany alone, gets a very large chunk of its oil and gas and coal from Russia. It doesn't even have LNG terminals. And look at the other diabolical aspect of this scenario. The Americans want to sell more. Till now, it was always arms, arms and more arms. This is, there is one consensus in the American administration. Sell as much weaponry as you can because of the power of the military industrial complex. Now it is energy. But America doesn't have the quantum of energy that Europe needs. It then went to the Gulf. And you saw what happened. A great humiliation for the American president, the crown prince of Abu Dhabi and the crown prince of Saudi Arabia refused to take his calls because he was going to plead with them to increase more productions and they had no intention of doing that. So this, I'm not sure, uh, it shows the Americans in an extremely poor light. They are not following his bidding. They are doing things in their own interest. And at some stage, I suspect the, we will see the Europeans doing the same as well. Mm -hmm. And so my, my last question to you uh, before I wrap up is, um, again, coming back to what I said, I would like to know on India and West Asia, you have an entire chapter on that. Um, but you said that, you know, India's policy uh, towards WANA has not evolved. Uh, but then we saw Quad 2 happening. How do you see and what do you expect India to do in order to take the next step uh, with terms of, you know, its relationship with the Saudis, UAE and others? What we need is what I have accused the Americans of not having a vision, a long-term vision, a long-term vision for our country. 
टेन ईयर्स लेटर यू वे डू यू वॉन्ट टू बी वंस यू हैव दैट विजन एंड क्लैरिटी बेस्ड ऑन डिस्कशन कॉन्सल्टेशन एक्सट्रा यू हैव अ क्लैरिटी देन यू हैव टू डिवेलप अ स्ट्रैटेजी अ स्ट्रैटेजी इज हाउ वॉट यू विल नीड टू डू इन ऑर्डर टू रीच दैट विजन रियलाइज दैट विजन एंड इट इज इंक्रीमेंटल यू विल हैव टू have clarity with regard to what you want to do you will have to provide resources financial technical technological human resources you will need then an action plan what will you do annually or by annually how and constantly review in this setting we, once you have this setting you will then have a clarity of vision with regard to what you should do with regard uh, with regard to west uh, with regard to west asia west asia is a complex territory but it is a territory where our crucial long term interests are involved these are abiding interests i mentioned very often and it pains people to listen to me when i say that your heart bleeds for one indian worker suffering in one corner of saudi arabia in the first hours of war in the gulf several thousand indians will be dead you saw just one missile from the houthis going to abu dhabi and two indians were killed can we afford to be complacent when such interests are involved we should be and it's a diplomatic effort i'm not talking about a military effort it's a diplomatic effort a diplomatic initiative bringing security stability and order to the region we have the credentials for it work with partners which have similar interests russia china japan china and uh, and china now how should we go forward i have a part of that and it will be a little unsettling for people india's crucial relationship has to be with china it's not a deep insight i just look at the map 4000 of under uh, undemarcated border you have to deal with them a relationship with the americans cannot provide india with the security that it needs india has to work for its own security you cannot go elsewhere the mistake that we made i see there's some course correction taking place now the mistake that we made is to go so deep into the quad one the so called quad because we then entangled ourselves with the american maritime effort in south china sea which the americans are fully capable of handling on their own but what we did was raising the quad to minister level from joint secretary to minister level and then putting our navy into the south china sea becoming a part of a very robust military alliance against china and i believe i believe this is a personal view i believe the chinese responded to this robust acceptance of the american embrace over a previous 10 years with shifting of the troops to ladakh so just one small question to that because this is what we also hear um is from the government that a quad is nothing military it's all about uh, vaccine partnership uh, economic partnership and supply chain to uh, when you talk about more relationship with china uh, we've very clearly now taken a stand that you know there'll be no business with china normal unless there is peace and Absolutely. tranquility at the border i areas. agree with that let me clarify both points that is the course correction that you mentioned it was supposed to be a security arrangement until the dark happened look at the changes that happened after that the americans abandoned that quad because it already has a security arrangement with japan and set up aukus in the month of august last year the security arrangement in the region is aukus australia united states and uk and it is going forward as a very robust military partnership it is what is now called committed to it is committed to climate change technology partnership vaccine vaccination partnership, partnership 
which means it is nothing. It's over. It is of no significance whatsoever, no strategic significance. I think that is very valuable course correction from India. Visit of Putin in December last year and Wang Yi's visit after that. These are indications that the message of course correction has been heard and received well in Moscow and Beijing. I would imagine, because this was nobody's interested in war. It was a signal. Just as we signaled our embrace of the Americans through Quad, they signaled their unhappiness through Ladakh. That is now, it's going to be corrected. I think it will be corrected incrementally in the near future. What is the way forward? Strategically, what is the way forward? To engage with China at multilateral fora. RIC, BRICS, Shanghai Cooperation Organization. What we have done is we, in the quest for Quad, we abandoned these three platforms. This is what Putin was attempting to convey to us. Go back to our IC. Now what the Americans are telling us, the Americans and their <laughs> apologists in India, far too many of them that I can see, what are they saying? Oh, the, after Ukraine, uh, Russia is going to be the junior partner of China. Oh, yes. Okay, possibly. I don't think so, but I accept. What will be India vis-a-vis -vis the Americans? Number one, equal. Two, number three, we won't be even the tenth partner. Is that what you want to be? And is this what India has been all about over all these decades? To be the tenth partner of the United States that has no sensitivity or interest with regard to the concerns of its friends. Therefore, India is, I think, we are very deep into correction. I think the messages are clear. I am the one who is actually saying this in public, but I think that this is my understanding. It's a personal understanding. I'm not quoting anybody. I don't visit South Block. Because otherwise, because I write. The moment you write, you don't we meet these people. Because then you retain independence of assessment. And there is no fear of being wrong. <laughs> either. So this is what I believe. I believe that India's long-term interests lie in Eurasia and the Indian Ocean. In Eurasia, we must engage with the three platforms that I have mentioned. With regard to the Indian Ocean, which I believe begins from Malacca and goes up to East Africa, this is of crucial interest to India. And in this maritime space, India's and China's interests are identical. This we have exactly the same interests. In fact, their life is more complex because to carry their goods and their energy, they have to cross Malacca. I don't have to cross Malacca. But I am concerned about the Gulf and the Red Sea, the Arabian Ocean and the Suez. These are my areas of concern as they are China's areas of concern. We have to work with these people as they have to work with us. At the same time, ensure that your resources are there in abundance. You cannot have a weak hand. You will be respected only if you have a strong hand of your own. And if I may add, you will be respected in Washington DC where you tell the Americans, this is not acceptable to us. Sure. Thank you so much, sir. On that note, let me wrap up this episode of Page Turner. We were discussing Mr. Talmiz Ahmed's book, West Asia at War. It's a HarperCollins publication. Thank you for watching the print. Thank you very much.